Yeah, just like that. Oh, really? Uh, I got pretty good. So thank you all for coming tonight. We're here to talk about some issues that are both very interesting and very important. I'd like to begin by thanking some of our sponsors for making this event possible. From the philosophy department, I'd like to thank Mercedes Diaz, Anne Lepofsky, Pauline Mitchell, and Barry Lohr. From the Office of Undergraduate Education, Kara Mapeluso. From the Graduate School of Education, Catherine Rhodes. From the Daily Targum, Neil Kuypers and Cliff Wang. And from Rutgers Media Relations, Ken Branson. And I'd also like to thank a large number of Giving What We Can volunteers who helped with the publicity for this event to get so many people here tonight. So, thank you board to Boris, Marcelo, Mark, Tim, Lucy, Eric, Katie, Michael, Justin, Steve, Jessica, S Steve, Toby Ward, and uh, Will Crouch. Okay. So, tonight's talk was organized by Giving What We Can. And Giving What We Can is a group of people that are interested in fighting poverty around the world through the most effective means possible by giving their income to the charities that do it best. Our members pledge to give 10% of their income to the organizations that they believe best help people in the developing world. So far, we have 64 members who have collectively pledged over $22 million for this cause. Given What We Can was founded one year ago by philosophers at Oxford University. And tonight marks the launch of Giving What We Can Rutgers, a new chapter that's working toward the same mission. In the future, we're going to hold regular talks and social events for people that are interested in learning more about how they can best help people in the developing world. The first of these talks, titled A Crash Course on Effective Giving, will take place this Tuesday at 9.10 p.m. in Scott Hall 116. Members from Giving What We Can will lead discussions on key issues for thinking about how to best help people in the developing world. Giving What We Can has been heavily influenced by Professor Singer's thoughts. So we're very pl pleased to present him to speak tonight. He's published over 100 articles in academic journals and is the author of dozens of books on topics ranging from animal rights to bioethics to developing world aid. Remarkably, he's a world leader in each of these fields. In 2006, Time Magazine called him one of the world's 100 most influential people. His work is characterized by sensible, moderate arguments for radical conclusions about very important topics. He's done more than any other philosopher to link up the philosophical study of ethics with concerns that are pressing to both ordinary people and to policymakers. So for all of these reasons, we're very excited to welcome tonight's speaker, Professor Peter Singer. very much, Nick, um, and thanks to all of those who are involved in organizing this event and who obviously did such a terrific job in turning out, uh, getting the publicity out, and, and getting you all here. It's very exciting because I do think this is, even though I've given a lot of talks uh, over the years um, about issues like uh, global poverty and what we ought to be doing about it, this is um, a really special event, I think, because we are launching in the United States and, and here at Rutgers as what I hope will be the first of many chapters around the country, um, this organization Giving What We Can, which as Nick mentioned, involves making a personal commitment or pledge to be part of the, solu part of the solution to the problem, to make a difference to yourself. And I think we really, uh, it is possible to do that and it's empowering to think that you can do that and join with others do it. But let me go back to what the problem is and why I think we do have a moral obligation to do something about the problem. For many years now, going back to one of the early articles that I wrote, I've introduced the topic by way of a little 
parable or analogy. And I'll do it again. Some of you will be familiar with it if you've read some of my writings, probably. Um, but others won't, so it's, it's worth doing again. It doesn't take very long. I ask you to imagine that you're strolling across a park, or perhaps it's, it's the university campus here. And no doubt somewhere on the campus, there's an ornamental pond, just a shallow body of water that you walk past and you know it's quite shallow. Maybe you've seen people wading in it or playing in it on a hot day. But today it's not a hot day and you wouldn't expect to see anyone in it. But you do see someone splashing around in it. And when you look closer, you see it's a very small child, just a toddler who seems to be in danger of drowning there in the pond. So the first thing you do, of course, is, is you look around and you think, who's looking after this kid? Um, must be somebody looking after this kid. Too little to be by himself, but you can't see anyone. You can't see any parents, you can't see any babysitter, you can't see anyone else take around except you and the toddler. So your next thought, presumably, is, well, um, I could rush into that pond and pull out the child. And as I say, you know that there's no danger to you. There's nothing life-threatening about doing that. But it is a cold day, the muddy pond, and just as bad luck would have it, you put on your favorite pair of shoes, um, quite an expensive pair of, of shoes, which you don't really have time to get off if you're going to make sure that you rescue the kid. And they're not the kind of shoes that are built to get immersed in muddy water, so they're probably going to get ruined. And so you will be up for the cost of replacing them, plus getting wet, a bit of inconvenience. So perhaps you then have this thought. Well, do I really have to go and pull the kid out? After all, I didn't push the kid in. The kid's not my responsibility. I don't know who this kid is. Um, What's it to me? I could just walk on my way. My shoes would be fine. <laughs> would that be wrong? Well, if you think about that question, and I've asked many audiences what they think about that, and usually unanimously they say, yes, that would be wrong. Even though I didn't push the kid in, even though I don't know who the kid is, even though there is a cost to me in saving the child, you can't weigh a child's life against a pair of shoes, even your favorite pair of shoes. It just doesn't come anywhere near being comparable. And therefore, you ought to go in and save the child. And if you didn't do that, you didn't do that because you were concerned about your shoes, you would be doing something seriously wrong. Some people would go even further and say, you know, you're some kind of moral monster, if that's the case. Well, let's not worry about the moral monster, but anyway, I think we should agree that that would be seriously wrong not to rescue a child under those circumstances. But now let's look at the question that we're talking about, the real world question that does face us, rather than the little story that I told, which conceivably could face us, but probably isn't likely to. So look at the real world that we live in. According to the World Bank, which collects statistics on this, there are roughly 1.4 billion people in the world who live in extreme poverty. They define extreme poverty as not having sufficient resources to reliably meet your basic needs, or the basic needs of those who are dependent on you, your children, perhaps. Basic needs mean thing like, things like uh, food, obviously, um, water, safe, safe water to drink. Um, you have children to be able to educate your children at least to elementary school level. Um, some very minimal level of health care and provide shelter for yourself. So we're really talking about just the basic physical needs here. 
And as I say, they, they say that about uh, 1.4 billion, about a fifth of the world's population, cannot meet those basic needs. The income level required to meet those basic needs, according to World Bank at present, is the purchasing power equivalent of $1.25 US. A lot of those actually $90.93, so we've had a bit of inflation. <coughs> you could say, if you like, maybe that's something like $2 US per day. But it's the purchasing power equivalent of that. What does that mean? Well, some of you know how to travel in developing countries, and you might have noticed that if you go there with US dollars and you turn them over, go to the bank, change them to the local currency at whatever the rate is, and then you walk into some kind of place where you can get a meal, and you ask how much the meal is, and you do this little mental conversion to US dollars at the rate that you just exchange in the bank, and you think, gee, that's so cheap. I can get a meal here for maybe a dollar, or maybe 50 cents, whatever it is, depending where you are. So then you think, oh, well, $2 a day, that's not too bad. Maybe I could cope on $2 a day. But that's why it's important to realize that we're talking about purchasing power equivalent, not currency exchange equivalent. So the purchasing power equivalent means these people are living on as much as you can buy in this country for $2. And that's what they're living on for a day. That's important to realize because it's a way of expressing the difference between what you have and what they have to survive on. And you can think about what you spend $2 on. It's not very much. Maybe it's something like this. Or, you know, something else that you buy that you don't really need, uh, whether it's uh, drinks or whether it's clothing that you don't need to keep warm but because you know, you're know you tired of what you're wearing, um, or uh, entertainment, going out, concerts, going on vacation, all of the things that we spend money on without thinking too much about it, and we're talking about um, more than other people have to live on for a day. What does it mean to be trying to live on uh, that little each day? Obviously for many people it means that they can't be sure that they're going to get enough food. It doesn't mean that they're starving necessarily, certainly not that they're starving all the time, but it might mean that they don't have food security. So if the harvest is good, they'll be alright for that year. If the harvest is not so good, they won't be so good. Well, maybe the harvest will last for nine months, but maybe for the last three months, they'll be cutting down to one meal a day and they'll be hungry. But they, many of them, most of them will, might still get through, but they'll be stretching. They won't have safe drinking water. Um, they may have to walk for hours. It's usually a woman's job in most cultures to provide water for the household. So the women and young girls will have to carry water, maybe for an hour or two a day, and that water will come out of a river and won't be safe to drink anyway. So either they have to spend more time gathering fuel or spend money on fuel to boil it so that it's safe, or they drink it when it's not safe. They drink it when it's not safe. They, particularly their small children, are likely to get ill, likely to get diarrhea. And another thing that you can't do if you're living on that little money is you can't afford any kind of health care. There probably isn't any kind of health care in your village anyway, so you would have to travel somewhere to get it with your sick child, and you can't afford to do that, or maybe there isn't any means to do that. Or if you live in a shanty town, maybe there is health care, but you have to pay for it, and you can't afford to pay for it. If uh, you live in a country where schools are not free, and in many developing countries they're not free, you can't afford to pay to educate your children, even though that might be quite a modest amount of money. So, there's a whole lot of things that are likely to happen to you in terms of getting ill, not being able to get health care, not having your children educated, 
getting into this poverty trap therefore. If anything does go wrong, um, if you, let's say you, perhaps you keep a cow and get milk from the cow, the cow gets sick, you can't afford any veterinary care, the cow dies, you can't afford to replace the cow. All of these small crises are completely devastating for uh, families living in extreme poverty. And one result of this is, of course, a much higher death rate. A shorter life expectancy, for a start. So the life expectancy in developing countries is around 50. Uh, here it's in the, the high 70s, so essentially we live half as long again as, as they do. They lose um, that extra 25 to 30 years of their lifespan. And in particular, they're much more likely to see their children die before their fifth birthday. UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Organization, tells us in its most recent report, the 2010 report, that came out uh, uh, just a month or two back, that 8.2 million children under five die each year from avoidable poverty-related causes. Now, that's, when you think about it, a pretty terrible figure. It's hard to grasp such a large figure. So break it up on a daily basis. It comes to something like 22,000 children dying every year. You'll all remember the earthquake that occurred in Haiti last year and the outpouring of uh, donations that, uh, that occurred as a Result of, of that, a lot of people felt that was an immense tragedy, as indeed it was, and wanted to do something about it. The death toll from that earthquake is now estimated as being around 240,000 people. Well, if you think about the death toll from poverty related causes, I said just the children under five is 22,000 a year. You add the adults, you'll certainly get to something like 30,000. So um, the death toll in Haiti was probably just a week or eight days of the death toll from avoidable poverty related uh, diseases. That's been going on every week since the earthquake in Haiti and is continuing to go on now. Why don't we have the same outpouring of concern and response to that? Well, the reason is pretty obvious. It's not in the media in the way that that event was. Think back to other dramatic events like the Asian tsunami a few years earlier or Hurricane Katrina. Those dramatic events make very powerful television footage and monopolize the media. Everybody talks about them. People say we should do something and a lot of people do something. But when children are dying in villages, in ones around, around the world, um, it's not something that is newsworthy. There's really just nothing to cover. The TV cameras aren't there. And so it happens beneath the radar, and we don't talk about it, and very few people do anything about it. It's not that you can't do anything about it. Because in fact that figure of 8.2 million, although as I said, it's a, it's a terrible figure to think of that number of deaths occurring that could be prevented. It's actually an improvement over the previous year and over the year before. I wrote a book called uh, The Life You Can Save about this topic, which came out in March 2009. If you have a copy of the hardback of that book, you'll see that the figure is um, 9.7 million. And if you look at the paperback, which came out this year, it's 8.8 .8 million. So it's coming down. That's the good news. If you go back further, in fact, if you go back to the 1960s, it's 20 million. Although the population of the world now is about double what it was in the 1960s. And the population of uh, the people, the so, so the proportion of people dying from poverty-related causes has actually dropped 
quite dramatically. So we can make a difference, and a number of organizations are making a difference to help people in extreme poverty, to reduce disease, to provide better agricultural te techniques, to provide more education, and so on. Um, so it's not as if this is an insoluble problem. It's not. And that's why, if I go back to the little story of the child in the pond that I mentioned before, that's why there is a parallel between these situations. Not an exact parallel, of course. But there are children dying. And there are things we can do to help. There are things we can do to save life. By donating to one of a number of effective organizations, you can actually have a high degree of confidence that your donation will, depending on what you give, save a life or save several lives, or perhaps join with the donations of others to save a life. And if we're talking about the sacrifice of a pair of shoes, well, probably the amounts that it takes to save a life are not so different from the cost of a pair of shoes. Depends a bit where you buy your shoes, but certainly if you take the train up to New York and wander down Fifth Avenue and look at some of the expensive boutiques and, and fashion stores there, um, you'll have no trouble paying $500 for a pair of shoes. And if that's the kind of shoes that you're wearing when you <coughs> needed to save the child in the pond, um, certainly that amount of money, I think there are organizations where you can have a high degree of confidence that you would save a life for a donation of around $500. Which, as I say, is, is not so much when we think of things that we, we spend money on. And it may well be quite a lot less. There's a lot of figures that are thrown out. I wouldn't um, necessarily trust the very lowest figures. Um, some of you might have seen uh, advertising talking about providing bed nets for children in Africa so that they don't get malaria, keep out the mosquitoes. Um, malaria is a major killer of people in developing countries, a major killer of children. It can be prevented by bed nets, that's certainly true. But some of the information seems to suggest that for $10 you can provide a bed net and save a child's life. And that's a little too swift. Yes, for $10 you can provide a bed net, um, but not every bed net saves a child's life. Obviously, children have been living and surviving in this area before there were bed nets, so not everybody gets malaria. And you would have to know how many bed nets does it take to distribute to save a child's life. Does it take 20? Well, then you can save a life, child's life for, for $200. Uh, does it take 50? And so on. You can do the math. So, um, now, we need to think about this critically, about which organizations are likely to be effective, but uh, I do believe that there are many effective organizations. Uh, if you want to know more details, uh, I've set up a website with um, the same name as the title of, of the book, The Life You Can Save. So go to thelifeyoucansave.com. You can uh, find some uh, lists of organizations that uh, I recommend or that other organizations recommend. Um, and uh, Giving What We Can has a, a website in England where Toby Ord, who set that up, also has some organizations that, that he recommends. So, um, it is possible to save lives and to make a difference. So I think that the, there's enough of a parallel between the child in the pond and our situation with regard to those in extreme poverty, to say that the judgment that I assume you made, that pretty much everybody does make, that it would be wrong to walk past a child at the pond, but that judgment also applies to us when we understand that we can save the lives of children, or adults for that matter, in developing countries at a somewhat similar cost to ourselves. There is something really bad happening in the world right now. Children dying of preventable diseases. There is something that we could do about that at 
relatively modest cost to ourselves, doesn't require heroism. And I can't see any moral arguments to show that uh, we ought not to do that, if there's anything wrong with that. So it seems to me that that is what we ought to be doing. We ought to be helping people in extreme poverty where we can make a big difference for a relatively modest cost to ourselves. It may not emotionally feel like the case of the child at the time, because the child isn't in front of you. But I think that here we should really be trying to make that imaginative leap and put ourselves in the position of, let's say, families whose children are dying because of these poverty-related diseases. And think about that, and perhaps we'll start to feel something of a corresponding emotion to what we would feel if the child were in front of us. But even if we don't, I think we should be prepared to think about the ethical situation and follow through with what our reason tells us to do then. It's, it's not surprising, after all, that we should have a, a different emotional response to people right in front of us. We've evolved from humans who lived for all of our evolutionary past until the last century or two in a situation where we only really knew about people close to us, or we could only help people close to us. We were powerless to help needy who were far away from us because we didn't even know the, what their need was. We couldn't communicate rapidly enough. So of course we've evolved with a kind of evolution, with an emotional apparatus that is for face-to-face -face situations. But now that we've developed instant communication and the ability to help people on the other side of the world, I think we have to expand our moral horizons so that we recognize that they are people to whom we have obligations as well as having obligations to people who are close to us. Now, um, you know, I don't want to go on too long because I want to um, allow you some time for, for questions and then there's an important part of the program uh, to follow after that. But um, I'm sure that many of you are thinking of the question, well, if I agree that I have this obligation to do something to help those in extreme poverty, how far does that go? What does it commit me to? Because you probably have been able to, to work out for yourself that suppose you do give what it takes to save a child's life. Suppose, let's say, it's $200 and you, you give $200. Having done that, there are other children still. You might have saved one child's life, but there are other children. There are these 8.2 million children, at least, um, who still need help. And so you could give again to help another one of those, and you could give again and again and again. And it doesn't seem like there's any stopping point. It seems like unless you've impoverished yourself to the point where you have nothing more to give, the argument is one that can still be reiterated. It's still the case, as long as I've got something that's not really a necessity that I'm spending money on, it's still the case that I ought to be giving it away. Is that right? There's one sense in which I suppose it is right. Um, it isn't, there isn't really an obvious stopping point. And you could say it would always be better if resources went to where the greatest need is. But that's, I think, an argument that is not really an argument that uh, can be addressed to human beings as we are, given what we know about human nature, if what we want to do is to achieve some results, preferably the best results that we can achieve, that is, the greatest amount of resources to reduce extreme poverty, uh, to save those people who are dying from extreme poverty. Because uh, we, we have to recognize that um, 
we're not saints, and there's a point at which we will resist extreme demands on us. So the question is, um, what should we set as a reasonable standard of giving that we can expect people to respond to positively? Expect a lot of people to respond to positively. And I think that's what we need to try to, to work with. And I don't really know quite what the answer to that question is. And in fact, if you look at my website, uh, thelifeyoucansave.com, and you look at uh, giving what we can, or listen to um, Nick and the other people who are pledging here tonight, who are talking about um, the pledge that they're making to giving what we can, um, there are different amounts that different people think is the right level to advocate. Is it 10% the giving what we can pledge? Is it more than that, as some people have pledged or are pledging? Is it less than that? The amount on my website is actually for almost everybody less than that. Because um, it's, it's a progressive scale that I've suggested that goes up depending on how much you earn. And although at the very top it gets to the proposal that you donate a third of what you earn, that's only for those who are earning millions of dollars per year. So probably not too many of you in the room here. Um, and if you're in the lower 90% of US taxpayers, to be in the lower 90% you need an income below $105,000 a year, then I'm suggesting that you give somewhere between 1% and 5%. So that's why I say for most of you, I assume, it'll be less than 10% that I'm suggesting, but I certainly think that it's not that difficult to give more than that. Um, and I hope that many of you will think, that, think of that as, as a minimal standard, maybe too low a standard, um, and, and want to do more like as giving what we can suggest. I think the point is really to set yourself a, a target, a reasonable target that you think you can cope with, and maybe then work up from that target. I know that's what I did, actually. I started back when I was a, a graduate student. Um, I started with 10%. And once that started to seem normal and not too difficult, worked up from there. So it's, it's certainly possible to do. And if the point is that if we could get enough people doing this, it would make a huge difference. In fact, if you know, we had all the affluent people in the world giving, the percentage that would be required in order to virtually eliminate extreme poverty, as I defined it before, would be quite small. It might be in the vicinity of 1 or 2 percent that we would have to give. Because it's not given the discrepancy of wealth that we have, it's not going to take a lot of our wealth, if we were all to give it, to virtually eliminate. There'll still be pockets of it somewhere, there'll be a civil war here, there'll be a government so corrupt we can't help over there. Um, you know, there'll be, there'll be particular problems. But the large scale mass poverty, I think we could virtually eliminate for a very small percentage of what we earn. But, you know, we, we give very little at the moment, and that's really the problem. That's the, the thought that I'm, I, I want to, to finish with. Um, a lot of Americans believe that they're living in the most generous nation on earth that already gives a lot of aid. In fact, just uh, in the last couple of days, um, there were the results of a survey released, which is a survey that's been done several times over the last 20 years. In fact, I quote the results of earlier surveys um, in uh, The Life You Can Say. In the survey, um, Americans are asked what, um, what percentage of the federal budget, of federal government spending, do you think the US government gives for foreign aid? The answer I quote in my book from the survey, because it was a survey done a few years ago, the median answer, okay, the median answer that I quote was 
of the federal budget. I can see some of your faces. The answer actually that people gave this year was 25% of the federal budget. They're going up. The most interesting answer that they give though actually is they're then asked what percentage of the federal budget do you think should go to foreign aid? And the median answer there was 10%. So Americans think that we're giving too much foreign aid because they think we're giving 25% on median. Some of course think we're giving more than that. But less than median. They think we're giving 25%. They think that's too much and we should only give 10%. You know what we are giving? Okay, we're talking about percentage of federal budget, it's not the percentage of gross national income. We're giving about 1% of federal government spending. If you're talking about how much are we giving of gross national income, it's, um, it's 0.24, it's 0 0.24. In other words, in terms of, of a percentage of, our, of what we earn as a nation, we're giving about 24 cents in every $100. But on the federal budget, Spending, we're giving about one in every hundred. So this is the you know, part of the problem that Americans think that we're giving very large amounts of federal spending, and perhaps I don't know they think they don't need to give very much because of that. Um, and you know, although there is some private giving to extreme poverty, of course, um, it doesn't actually add very much. It maybe gets us up to thirty cents, depending what you take into account. 30, 35 cents in every hundred dollars, but we're still way below what uh, the leading nations are giving. Nations like uh, Scandinavian nations, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Luxembourg. Um, they're all ahead of the United Nations target of 70 cents in every hundred dollars. 0.7 percent of gross national income. So we're not up among the better nations at all. We're more comparable to some of the poorer of the industrialized nations. So we're giving about the same amount as Greece and Portugal, for example, um, both of which are significantly uh, less affluent than we are. So that's why I think we, we can and we should be doing a lot more, and I hope that um, from tonight on, many of you will be doing a lot more. I'll stop at that point. I think we have some time for questions. Um, and uh, Nick, are you going to feel the questions? Oh, you, you've got the mic, is that right? People are supposed to come down the mic. Right, okay. Right. Okay, so why don't we start with you? Um, I just want to say imagine if you walk by the pond with your boots on and the pond has a hundred towers. I feel like this is one of the problems that I feel they won't make a difference. And another, that's one thing, and I also thought maybe you can comment on microfinance and like, give and the money comes back, we can give again as a transition for people that might have to give. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, so what if there were 100 or 500 people there? I mean, I think psychologically you're right that we feel that it's futile that we're not helping. Um, and that's why I stress that we are bringing down the number of children who are dying. We are reducing the number of people in extreme poverty. Um, so we are making a difference. And I think it's important to focus on the people that we're helping, even if there's other people we can't help. Think of the difference it makes to an individual family that their child can get a simple, inexpensive treatment for diarrhea and can survive. Think of the difference it makes that their daughter can go to school or that they can grow a better harvest and, and have more security. So um, I think that that makes uh, a real difference. And we, you know, even if there were 500 children and I could not possibly save them all before some of them drowned, I think I ought to save um, as many as I can. Uh, microfinance. Um, yes, microfinance is a good idea. Um, it's part of the solution. But don't, be, don't think that it's the whole solution. Um, microfinance definitely helps some people get out of poverty. It helps people most in societies that have a tradition of being entrepreneurs. Um, and it helps those who have the most of that entrepreneurial spirit. 
So um, it sometimes it doesn't reach all cultures equally, and it doesn't reach all strata of society. Sometimes some of the very poorest of the poor um, are not the people who are going to be applying for small loans or in a position to make effective use of small loans. So we have to do other things as well. But sure, if, if you think, if you like the idea of microfinance, you like the idea of small revolving loans that can make a difference, um, there's lots of organizations that are doing that. And again, some of those are listed on uh, the life you can say. I think, Don, you might have to get closer to it. Just try. Yeah, is it on? Try, try speaking right into it. No, it's not working. Why don't we take a question over here if that one's working? We'll come back to this with you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering uh, to what extent um, do we, I mean, we clearly have an obligation for a lot of people in these countries. But how can we honor those obligations while at the same time focusing on reducing the efforts of international institutions that sometimes very much help to keep these countries in extreme poverty, like the IMF with structural adjustment policy that makes them very vulnerable to economic shocks and commodity prices, or something like that? So how do we, you know, work to work to, you know, give what give what we can because that's very important, but also at the same time. You know, try to change the arrangement and distribution that results in this extreme poverty. Good, yeah, good point. Um, I think we need to be active citizens as well, right? I mean, I've been talking about one thing that we can do, but it's only a part of what we can do. We, we should be active citizens. We should be supporting organizations that are working for a more globally just international order. We should be contacting our political representatives about that. And some of the organizations actually do both. I mean, one of the organizations that I've got a long association with is Oxfam. Oxfam is a, actually a coalition of groups. Um, I've been involved with Oxfam uh, Great Britain, Oxfam Australia, and now Oxfam America. Um, they do direct grassroots village-based aid. That's most of what they do. But they also are a, a, a they, they also will lobby uh, governments for political reform. Um, <laughs> and some of their efforts have been quite effective. I think there's an effort going on now under the President Obama to reform USA, to make it more effective, um, and also to look at some of the other things that you mentioned in terms of the global trading order, and to make that work better. So I think we need to support those efforts as well. How are we going with this slide now? Good. Uh, my question is about more sustainable, sustainable development, and what do you suggest which organizations do suggest we should be donating to? Because when I read like Will I mean, I understand giving just for temporary aid is always good, but I'm more about sustainable development. So what organizations, for example, in particular, do you suggest we donate to? And what projects should we be working on rather than just giving something that will temporarily help people rather than help them the world? Right, right. Well, certainly most the organizations that I am recommending, I think, are concerned about sustainable aid. Um, to mention Oxfam again, um, they certainly are aware of the long-term problem. They're very reluctant to just hand out food. Um, they will hand out food in occasional emergencies, but that's only a small part of what of what they do because precisely as you said, they know it's not it's not sustainable. So um, they are doing things like helping people with better methods of agriculture that are sustainable and that are going to produce better crops for them. They also help people to protect their resources and environment to work against uh, perhaps large multinational corporations that are endangering their livelihoods. So for instance, um, if the people who are getting food by, by fishing and uh, their fishing rights are being violated by companies that are, uh, international companies that are trawling uh, the areas that, that they've traditionally fished, they'll try to defend them uh, in doing that. Um, there's a whole lot of other things that you can do to that. And uh, one, one other thing that I might mention is you can also support the uh, fair trade scheme because if you buy fair trade products, um, they not only are guaranteed to give a living wage return to the producers in developing countries, but they also uh, have to be sustainably produced. 
We'll take another one here. So I'm kind of interested in what you think our obligation should be in regards to poverty in the United States. Because even though the poverty in the United States, there are 45 million people after 2010 who are in poverty in the United States, and though it's not extreme poverty, I think that you could really make an argument that the utility of us uh, helping those in our own situation now would increase the likelihood of us being able to give more as a country to the developing nations through things like giving what you can. I think that it, 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 the, the skew to foreign uh, poverty might be disadvantageous to the uh, entire scheme of uh, eliminating poverty. Okay, well, that, that's an interesting argument. Um, I suppose I'm influenced by not only the fact that, as you acknowledge, the, the poverty is more extreme, um, and, but also the fact that your money will go a lot further in, in developing countries. Um, after all, if you compare with that uh, uh, $2 a day um, that, that people are living on, uh, with, with the poverty line in this country. Um, I think the poverty line for family of four here is something like $22,000. Um, well, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's tough. I, it must be very tough to live and support a family of four on $22,000. But if you think, how much does it take really to make a difference to that family? Obviously, you're talking about thousands of dollars. Giving them an extra $500 isn't really going to make very much difference at that level. Um, but if you're living on $500 a year, then another $500 can make a huge difference. And I'm not suggesting we just hand out cash either, of course, but I'm thinking about the kind of resources and the difference it makes. So, um, you know, that's why I focus on uh, giving to those in extreme poverty in developing countries. Uh, I certainly think there's something wrong about a country as rich as this that has 45 million people living in poverty. Um, I hope the government will do more to try to help those people and uh, improve their conditions and obviously find jobs for them. But I still think our priority should be in making the resources we have available to give go as far as possible. And that will mean giving it in developing countries rather than yeah. Come back to this time. Uh, hello, I have um, three uh, questions with points that we have both already mentioned. Uh, the first one was basically cynicism, you know, and how um, the money that is collected, you know, people think will it be well distributed, will it reach the people that need it the most and all the rest of it. And the second one is related to sustainability. Um, if uh, if you like to talk about mosquito nets, even if you buy, like, say, for one family or person, 20 of those and spend $200, and then, you know, they get bitten by, by a mosquito, cast the disease anyway, and, and, you know, they die, or whatever, then, you know, just thinking about what the best use of the money would be. And uh, the third one is connected also to, like, the home situation here, you know, um, just kind of comparing that money again, you know, how much how much you use it and where you use it. Um, it's more effective to use that, say, 200 here, you know, and at least you know that uh, you will be giving these people food to eat, or is it better to take a chance on those mosquito nets, let's say? You know, how, what's the best way to go? Right, okay. Well, they're all good questions. I have dealt with them a, a, a little bit. Um, in terms of the cynicism, and that's a good one to address because I think a lot of people think that, um, you know, I think there are really a, a number of highly effective organizations that are not going to waste your money. Um, and as I say, I've... Um, um, listings I've already mentioned, uh, Oxfam. Um, uh, let me mention an organization called GiveWell, which is actually an organization that studies other organizations. So if you go to givewell.org um, and look at what they write about organizations, I think you'll see that they are very rigorous in their scrutiny, and they recommend quite a small number of organizations, but the ones that they do recommend have been well checked out. So. Uh, we're not giving to governments, we're giving to organizations that are working directly in the field, directly in contact with the poor who need it. Um, and so I think that uh, you can have a high degree of confidence that your money uh, will be used uh, effectively. Um, 
you know, yes, it's true you may provide a mosquito net and the child may get bitten by a malaria anyway, but we do know that mosquito nets significantly reduce the number of children who get malaria and the number of deaths from malaria. So, you know, anything can happen, you know, if you give out 20 nets, sure, one child may still get bitten, but you can be confident that you've reduced the number of children who do get bitten by malaria carrying mosquitoes, and uh, I think that's that's important. Look, I'm sorry, but there are long lines. I don't think we can take any more. I don't know how much, how much time do we have for questions next. Okay, all right. So let's get through them and keep them fairly short, and I'll try and keep my answers fairly short. Yes, do you believe that the elimination of poverty is primarily a question of philanthropy, or is it one of politics and political action? And, um, in regards to this question, I think it's helpful to consider the situation of Haiti, which Haiti was the first um, free um, black republic in the world. And uh, But after they liberated themselves, uh, the French, with the help of the United States, kept them in uh, tremendous debt uh, for many years. And if you look at the United States supporting the dictatorship of, of Papa Duck. Uh, yeah, I do think we're going to have to cut the speeches. Sorry. I'm, I'm, just, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying point eight in that context. Yeah, look, um, there's a lot of reasons why nations remain poor. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can do to try to help them. Um, we certainly need to get off their backs. We certainly need to get fairer training policies. And um, we need to support movements to do that, as I, as I said before, in response to another question. But I do think philanthropy can make a difference. I think it's been shown that it can help people to, to get out of the poverty trap, can help them to provide enough to feed themselves, and it can help them to get some education, which can make a difference for them. So I think we should use whatever tools we have available, and certainly philanthropy is one of those tools, not the only one. So um, as far as, like, you have a reputation as utilitarian, and so far as I know that, that still is the case. Right. And utilitarianism is a view, as far as I understand it, says that you should do as much as you conceivably can to create prosperity and not just, you know, substantially contribute to it as 10% of America would. So if you want to live as a utilitarian in, in the United States and actually do as much as you could instead of just doing a lot, what would you like to be like? What would you do? Well, um, I think, you know, there would be various strategies that you could take. Um, you could... Uh, Try and earn as much money as you can and then give almost all of it away. Um, I think that's a good strategy. In my book, I talk about a guy called Del Kravinsky, who I lived down in Philadelphia, not very far away. Um, he made $45 million in real estate. Um, obviously, knew a bit about real estate investing and gave nearly all of that away and um, lived quite modestly with his family. I think you know, that's something that a utilitarian could certainly recommend. I also talk about Paul Farmer. We were talking about Haiti a, a while ago. Paul Farmer trained in medicine and then went to work in Haiti with the rural poor and founded an organization called Partners in Health, which uh, helps the health of the rural poor in several developing countries. That's another excellent organization, incidentally, if you want to give one. So you could do those things. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, you really, if you really want to live as a utilitarian, it's a very demanding ethic. Um, and you would really have to be trying to think all the time what will be the best to reduce the amount of suffering in the world, provide happiness, but I think reducing suffering is actually an easier thing to, to focus on. So it's very demanding, and I, you know, I am a utilitarian, but I'm not a saint, so I don't say that I follow utilitarianism perfectly, but I guess I do what I can to get, to keep going in that direction. Let's come over here. I'd like to know if you believe it's more important to give your time or your money because I know several on-site NGOs that would rather have you come to their place and actually work, even if it takes more money to get there than you would have donated because they think you're more likely to be inspired if you more in the long run. Well, possibly. I mean, I, I, don't, I think the answer to whether you should give your time or your money depends a bit on, on how much money you have and, and how much time you have, right? Um, if, if somebody is, uh, you know, really highly paid with, with, with high earning capacity so that um, you know, they can earn thousands of dollars a day consulting, um, I think it would be crazy for them to go and work in a soup kitchen, which basically um, you know, others who don't have that earning capacity could do. It would be better to earn the money and, and then give it away. 
Um, yes, it's often good for people to have some contact with the people they're helping. But uh, especially if we're talking about helping people in the developing world, not everybody can do that. You know, you, uh, and it takes a lot of time and, and resources to fly over there. So yes, when people go there, they get inspired, and it's good for people, some people to go. But not everybody can, can do that. So money is a very convenient way of giving that I think generally is effective. Um, uh, so I was, I've been sort of thinking about um, the way that people fulfill sort of the gap that governments leave, I guess, for, for charities. Um, because I'm, I'm from South Africa, and I guess it's similar to the US in a way, because there's just this massive inequality gap. It's probably much more extreme there. Um, but it seems like a lot of people are doing something you know, themselves, they might, you know, give food to someone when they come to the door and that kind of thing. Um, and it just seems like, you know, this sort of goes off the radar. I mean, economists like to think that everyone's self-serving and so on. Um, but I think probably our societies would break down if there wasn't this kind of uh, philanthropy. On, on the other hand, I guess, um, can we re really rely on that? And who's to say, you know, sort of free market? Uh, philanthropy is is the way forward. I just want to hear your thoughts, maybe on. Um. Well, I'm, I'm not a great fan of, of giving to someone who comes to your door asking for food. Um, for that matter, I'm not a great fan of giving money to people on the streets of New York, New York, or maybe New Brunswick too, who, who ask you for some change in the cap. Um, I do think that we need solutions that are a bit more structural than that um, to to deal with those problems. Um, and you know, we have to question about sustainable aid. I think we, we have to help people to get on their feet, and it takes something more to do that. Um, I think we're going to take one last question. Is that right? I think we're pretty much out of the five minutes. So I'm sorry for the others in line, um, but uh, we'll, we'll end with you. Uh, uh, so my question, um, I, think, I think you do recognize that structural adjustment policies have contributed largely to poverty. And I'm not sure necessarily that philanthropy of donating 10% of the income um, can alleviate that. So I, I do understand the approach of combining both. Um, but then my question would be, if it's up to, if it's up to the individual to act responsibly um, towards the local community, um, I, think we, I think we would have to start thinking about um, kind of our daily ethical lives and where the money we, that we get in terms of um, what, whatever kind of um, position we have in society where the money comes from. Because ultimately, if that's, if that's perpetuating a cycle in which structural justice policies continue, then I'm not sure that donating 10% of your income would actually be a problem, but would just perpetuate the structural policy. But, but the question is, what are you going to do about it, right? You can think about where the money that you're earning comes from, or that money you can think about what you're spending it on. But you have to do something about it. And I think giving philanthropically is something very practical that we can see makes it a real improvement for the lives of some people. Um, I don't know really how to reliably affect the global economic order, but as I say, I think we can be active citizens. But to think about um, what am I, where's the money I'm earning coming from, I mean, I could think about, I guess I get paid out of Princeton University endowment and the fees of students. Um, you know, but and, and no doubt that's come from all sorts of investments, some of which I would not approve of. But um, would I be more effective if I therefore said, well, I'm not going to work at Princeton, therefore. I have to find something else to do. Probably won't earn as much. I won't have as much as I can give away. I also won't have a platform, like it or not, in this country. If you're a university professor, that gives you a platform to speak to other people. More people listen to you. So it would be, I think, kind of self-defeating to really think that because the sources of the money that I'm earning are impure, um, I shouldn't be taking it. Um, I think we have to be realistic about what the opportunities we are we have to make a difference. And I think we should be looking at how we can, in the most practical and concrete way, actually change the situation that we're in and make the world better. Thanks very much. So we have just a little bit more. 
a little bit to finish up here tonight. So first, just a few announcements. Once we're done, we're going to have a book signing here in the lobby. We have some books out here. Professor Singer will be here to talk to you. Second, if you found this event interesting, we hope you'll attend some of our future events. So if you didn't hear it when we came in, we're having a follow-up event this Tuesday at 9, 10 p.m. at Scott Hall 116. It's called A Crash Course on Effective Philanthropy. And several of the Giving What We Can members are going to be talking about what are the very most important things to be thinking about if you want to make a difference through giving. Third, if you have a questionnaire when you came in and it was placed on your sheet, please hand that to one of the people with the name tags as you're headed out. We use this information for self-evaluation and to get funding for more events like this. Finally, for those of you who need to sign in for a class, please write down your name and the class that you're attending on a sheet of paper and give it to one of our representatives. So let me close with some final thoughts. We've heard a lot tonight about our obligations to give. And we've heard some suggestions about what kinds of things, uh, what, what level of giving would be appropriate for us. One thing that's interesting to think about is how big of an impact can we make if we decide to go ahead and give at different levels. So some of us in giving what we can take Professor Singer's arguments very seriously. So Mark Lee and I, for instance, have made a pledge, which some of you may have seen in the Daily Target, to give 50% of our future earnings once we're finished with our PhD program. Um, We understand that not everybody is interested in doing that kind of thing, and that's not within everybody's range, and not everyone feels compelled to do it. But let's think about how far you can go with a more modest standard and more traditional standard that giving what we can recommends, which is 10% of your earnings. So there's two things to think about here. One of them is what is the size of the impact that I can produce by giving this much? And the second thing to think about is what will the cost to me be? So let's, to think about how much you could do by giving that much, let's take as a simple example one of the organizations that Giving What We Can recommends. It's called Stop Tuberculosis Par Partnership. GiveWell, which Professor Singer already mentioned, is an independent charity evaluator that's evaluated this organization. And they estimate that it costs somewhere between $150 and $750 to save a life if you give money here. So for purposes of estimation, let's just take the midpoint and assume that it costs $450 to save a life. <coughs> College graduates throughout their career, if you take the long-term average, can ex expect to earn about $60,000 a year. You may not earn that right away, but many of you will earn more than that later in your careers. If you worked for 40 years, that would mean $2.4 million. If you gave away 10% of that money, that would mean $240,000. If you had organizations that are as effective as Stock TV Partnership, and again, it's hard to project this far into the future, your lifetime giving would amount to saving about, it would actually, a little bit more than 500 lives. It's amazing to think that that kind of feat is within the reach of most of the people in this room. If you wanted to, you could save 500 lives. So it's a very powerful idea. That's the main kind of thing that we're thinking about. Whether we think that's a moral obligation or not, it's a good idea. So we think it's worth doing. So the second question here is what will it cost you if you do this yourself? I think it's important here to keep the proper perspective. Giving 10% of your income to the poor is an ancient standard that goes back a long time. People were doing this long before we were recommending it. And those people were much poorer than we are. We should also remember that someone who earns $25,000 a year is in the top 3% of the world's wage earners. 
giving 10% of their income would still leave them in the top 3.8%. If about 97% of the world is managing to do it, maybe we can as well. So we have something where we can produce a massive impact at a relatively small cost to ourselves. Some of us would even say it isn't a net cost. Some of us would say we get a great amount of satisfaction knowing that we're doing something like this that makes a massive impact. And that's the way that we at Giving What We Can think about this kind of idea. So for my final thought, I want to stress the importance of, if you decide to give, giving your money to the most effective causes that you can find. So we talked about an estimate of saving a life for something in the ballpark of $450. A study of 587 different medi life-saving medical interventions found that the median cost to save a life was something like $41,000. So there's a difference here of a factor of 100, a difference between six, saving six lives over your career or 500. When the stakes are this high, we need to take the effectiveness of giving very seriously. For this reason, Giving What We Can and other organizations like GiveWell have done careful research into the effectiveness of aid. You can find our research on our website, givingwhatwecan.org. You can find information about our upcoming events here at Rutgers at givingwhatwecan.org slash Rutgers. If you found the ideas presented tonight interesting, we hope you'll join us at our future events. If saving lives abroad is the kind of thing that you care about, and giving 10% of your money seems like it's worth it to you, we hope you'll consider becoming a member. Thank you all for coming.